they're not the worst team in baseball anymore. No, I noticed that. It's the little things in life. Exactly. Now, by one game, but still, you know, that's right. Good morning, Melissa. There you go. Can you? The walk itself is um, 14 days. How many miles? Just just around 200, right around 200. 198 on the trail. Between all the other, some of the B and Bs are not right on the trail, and some other walking. It'll be a little over 200 by the time it's done. So it's about some days are 10, some days are 20. It just depends. Some of the early days are when you're in the Lake District are hilly, so they're not as long. Um, some of the days as you get further east, the, the landscape gets flatter. By the time you're in that part of the eastern York, uh, Yorkshire, the moors out there are a classic, just barren, flat landscape. You know, the weather would come in over the North Sea off the Arctic and just blow every, nothing survives that, right? You know, just knock everything down. Uh, but it's a national park. I mean, it's its own unique uh, environment. So I walked through three national parks. Well, there's, there's a hill on Pelican, and uh, it's like five miles up the mountain. And there's a lot of people that are dedicated to oh. the rural part. OK, yeah. Sure. Uh, looking at houses, and I'm surprised at how big the national parks are. Well, the part I'm walking through, literally, so I'm walking from west to east. It's 198 miles. Seventy percent of the walking is through three national parks. They're almost like pearls on a necklace, right across, running across that part of England, just with some narrower strips between them. Um, and then, yeah, there, those are. So I'm excited to see them, actually. Well, we should get started for those who are here and those who are online. Good morning. Happy Pentecost Sunday, everyone. Welcome to session three of the Politics of Jesus. We had a break last week for the holiday, and this is our final session. And it is, I will send you the advocate. So I didn't plan it to be on Pentecost Sunday, but it is appropriate after all. I am Peter Holmeyer, the rector here at Christ Episcopal Church, and this series is an, is an effort to make it clear about our role. Advocate is such an interesting word. We'll be getting into that, that this is the word that Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit. And in light of when he speaks of the advocate and what it means about his ministry, and then our ministry as well. We've got, um, again, just as this little bit of background before we get started, and because we've skipped a week, we're going to have a little synopsis of the first two sessions. It's not quite as material heavy as the last two, so the, hopefully there'll be some time for questions as well. But just some very basic background pieces because often folks will say, you know, I wish the church would be non-political, apolitical. I think that that is a challenging interpretation of what is happening in the Gospels and in the life of Jesus. And so I want to give a little background about what it means to be political. And it's not complicated, folks. It really is any activities associated with making decisions in groups, related to power dynamics. That's all politics are. Whether you like it or not, there's politics in a vestry meeting, for example. Um, they might be well-intended, and they might be well-received, but it's still decision-making that has to do with groups and power dynamics. And of course, the thing about any kind of limitation of resources is that there won't, there's very rarely full agreement on how they should be allocated. So three things to understand about any political figure, and this helps put Jesus, I believe, in an important context that we often miss inside the church as we focus on 
the salvific nature of Jesus and the personalist relationship with Jesus, both of which are important, but this third leg of the stool of understanding who Jesus is and who we are called to be as followers of the risen Christ, it's important to understand these elements because they also impact our own lives as well. The first thing is context. So really the background, the time period, and what's important at that time. Covered that in session one, destroy this temple. The actions of this public figure, what they say and what they do, are always the best indications of what they're into, of any public figure, what their intentions are. And that was handled that in session two, two weeks ago. For this, I was born. And of course, all three of these titles are direct quotes from Jesus, from the Gospel of John. And then, then the third critical thing I understand that we need to know about any public figure is what their intended impact is. They're doing it for a reason. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I will send you the advocate. But before we begin, like all good work, it is best to begin with prayer. So we have this wonderful prayer from the Book of Common Prayer. Back in that section that the book doesn't naturally fall open to, it's not page 355, or now for all of you that do morning prayer with us during the week, page 77 or page 80, there's a beautiful set of prayers back there, and this is one found there for the influence of public opinion. And I invite you to join me in reading this. Almighty God, you proclaim your truth in every age by many voices. Direct in our time, we pray, those who speak where many listen and write what many read, that they may do their part in making the heart of the people wise, their mind sound, and its will righteous, to the honor of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we're just going to have some quick synopsis overview of the first two sessions. And in case there were any hanging questions on that, I think there's enough time this morning. I'll have a moment for that as well. Session one, again, was destroy this temple. And it was about resistance and revolt in the time of Jesus. And then really, again, this is the uh, executive summary of what I talked about for an hour. This time period that stretches for quite a significant period of over 230 years from before the birth of Jesus with the Mecca Maccabean Revolt, which happens in 164 BC, and stretching through the first uh, Roman-Jewish War, which lasts from 66 to 73 uh, of the Common Era, but with the critical event, of course, being the capture and destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple by the Romans in 70 of the Common Era, is the context, it is the background, it is the daily life and breath of the people who lived in the areas that we think of as Israel, whom they understood to be Galilee and Samaria and Judea. And that in that time period, there were, as I'm not going to get into all of this again, numerous revolts. But the Maccabean one is essential because it is a time when Jewish leaders overthrew outside overlords and established the only time period after the reestablishment of the kingdom of Israel after their return from the Babylonian exile where they were an independent state for about 100 years. So there's this continued sort of friction, low level and then sometimes breaking out in flame, breaking out in open revolt around trying to overthrow the overlords who are the Romans. And not only that, the other thing that I really wouldn't want, I, I think we can often overlook because it doesn't show up in the gospel text at all, is how central these events almost certainly were to Jesus as he grew up. The gospels are consistent in that Jesus is from a town in Galilee, tiny little town of Nazareth, maybe 200 people lived there. That Jesus, as the son of a carpenter, 
and as a carpenter himself, the better translation of that is sort of skilled builder. So it would be a person who would be able to go and help build some sort of whatever kind of structure you're working on. That they would have almost certainly largely been employed in both his father and then himself in this city of Sephoris, which is only about four and a quarter miles away, and that was a big international city with lots of Roman and Greek influence. So he would have been exposed to their cultures and then what we'll talk about, about their systems and their way of ruling the land. But not only that, the fire and the sword, the blood that came out of this time period were known and seen very dramatically in Sephoris. There was a revolt where the city was captured by bandits, rebels, depending on the way you would choose to translate it. Lestai, this is the same word that's used for the for those who are crucified next to Jesus, where they captured the city of Sepphoris. This happened almost at the time of Jesus' birth. It was held for 10 years by rebels, and then the city was destroyed when the Romans retook it, raised to the ground. This would have happened when Jesus was about 10 years old. There were apparently over a thousand crucifixions and everyone else in the city was sold into slavery. Then the city was rebuilt from the ground up by Herod Antipas, and Jesus, as a skilled worker, would have been there working on the city. So the, the context of the time is not only important in a general sense. It is important because Jesus' background would have been directly tied into experiencing this right there in the backwaters of Galilee. Then two weeks ago, we taught, the session was for this I was born. And this one is about deeds and actions of a political figure in this case, Jesus. And I really emphasized his proclamation and confrontation. You may remember that the one critical element I wanted to make sure that we used as a lens to discuss this is this idea of a domination system. A domination system is the pyramid on the bottom rather than this more organic shape at the top. I would actually not say that the partnership system has the best visual model. I think a web would be an even better visual model or when you think about, and think about the way the, the, the World Wide Web works, that's an even better one. So it's just all these interconnections that work in all these different ways. But in a domination system, power flows from the top down. And of course, you only have a limited number of folks who can be at the top. And, there, and the intention and expectation of this kind of system is the maintaining of control. So that's done through domination, typically politically, economically, and in the ancient world, religiously is just as important. So the Romans relied on collaborators for this system to be able to be effective. There weren't enough Romans to go out and actually fill every position that was needed in every province to make this kind of a system work. So they used what was known as client kings. That's what Herod the Great was. That's a local leader who rules sort of an intermediary and has some semi-autonomous powers. And then, of course, we went into depth about this two weeks ago. The high priests and the Sanhedrin were understood by the Romans as the way to keep control of the people of Israel. You may remember that there was a very simple equation that I think is honest about how the Romans understood their relationship with the people, the Jews. So if you want to control the Jews, you need to control the temple because they only have the one temple and life is centered around the temple. And if you want to control the temple, you control the priests. So there's these series of collaborators that are working with the Romans. These are part of everyday life in that system. Of course, domination systems are not new to the world. They're not unique to this part of the world. They haven't disappeared just because the ancient world is gone. 
And this system economically is grounded in this consolidating of land. We talked about the latifundius system. This is the Roman system of large estates, which were focused on export products rather than things to be used locally. And Jesus confronted this system through his teaching and his deeds. That was a large part of what we talked about that week. There's lots and lots. There could be a very long series, might be interesting, where we would look at the parables. There are a lot of parables that when you look at them through this lens, it sheds new light on them. The number of parables there are about lending, about land, right? Any of these kinds of, or any of these kinds of things are, are about day labor. There's a lot of that. Day labor is tied into this latifundia system. There's this huge increase in day labor. It'd be very interesting to look at this. So he talks about the system through his parables. I would say subversively. Again, it's an interesting way to look at it. As a matter of fact, next time you're reading one of the parables and you think, what is Jesus after here? You might imagine that he's not a capitalist when you read it. Um, and that he's subversively actually getting at some of these systems. It's an interesting lens to look at. And then the deeds which really culminate in Holy Week with Palm Sunday, talked about the parallel parades that were coming into Jerusalem and that these parades were intentionally the one as a critique of the one from the empire coming in the other way and that they are done with planning. Jesus sends his disciples to find the donkey, which he, he tells them they know he's coming for, and they're done with an intention that way, just like a political protest would be. And then finally, the expectation of a system of domination is what we see that gets sort of completed on Good Friday. And that is that if you stand against this sort of a system, what will happen will be that you will, whoops, good heavens, sorry. What happens is that you'll be eliminated. The system has to keep itself in, in control. But what the Easter story tells us is that systems of domination can still meet with unexpected, surprising, and life-giving results. So that's a little bit of a recap of where we are. I'm going to grab my mouse and we can take a couple of minutes here if there were any questions or comments on that. Yes, Terry, please. Yeah, Sephoris. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yep. So in case you're online, it was just a comment by uh, Terry that this kind of a raising of cities and a domination system sounds like modern day Russia. And I would not disagree with you at all, Terry. I think that this is, of course, what we're really going to get at today. You know, it's just an advanced class around here, you all. I should let you teach the class. Uh, it would make this a lot easier on me. My Saturday night would get over earlier, that's for sure. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, domination systems are absolutely one of, or maybe the original, one of the original forms of human organization. And so they're never going to go away entirely. Um, the question is, and I think this is why when we testify, to the role of Jesus in our lives and what happened at the resurrection. Partially, I believe what we're doing is talking about standing up to systems like this because that's what Jesus did. And they haven't disappeared in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, there are places in the world, there are people in the world that would critique our own country that way as well. Mike. This would give equal time to the uh, other political systems. Wouldn't we say that the domination is the same we get with uh, 
American corporation. Right. Uh, you yep. Know, you, uh, the, yes. The best you can be benevolent yeah. and Bill Gates wanting to use his money for good. Yes. But at the worst, you've got Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos acquiring power and money simply to dominate. Right. So if you're with us online, and Mike, thank you for being nice and loud, but there's not a lot of mics, just for helping folks out. Uh, Mike was um, <clears throat> pointing out that there are domination systems that are not solely political. So in, particularly in the modern world where multinational corporations have such a reach and so much influence, it, couldn't you make an argument that a number of them work under a system that's a domination system? And that would actually be my number one way where I would say folks would say that we still live under a system like that as well. There certainly are critiques that what we call modern day liberal capitalism is just an exportation of the bottom of the pyramid overseas or to places where we don't encounter it anymore, that it still exists. Now, I don't know that that's, I think there's, there's room for conversation in there, but there's at least room for conversation in there. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Okay, great. Those were great. So I want to talk about, to talk about the advocate, to talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit, talk about why Pentecost is such an important holiday for the church and what it means that it's the birthday of the church. I need to do just a little bit more background work for you. And that's around what a prophet is and who the last prophet might be. So there's who is the last prophet? This is sort of, and you know, I, I actually am not, this is, this is a hypothetical question, Mike. You don't need to try to answer it. Because there's more than one answer, actually, to this question. Um, the first thing to understand is that in traditional Jewish understanding at the time of Jesus, the, the last of the traditional prophets was Malachi. Now, that's why the book of Malachi is found last in the Old Testament. The books in the Old Testament are not in order by, by date that they were written, friends. Um, so th that's not the reason it's located in that place. It's located in that place because at the time of Jesus, they understood that Malachi would be the last of the prophets before the coming of the Messiah. And that maybe at the time of the Messiah, there would be additional prophets who would come with or just before the Messiah. Sounds familiar, John the Baptist, right? As a piece of that. But the prophets, and again, the Messiah is a prophet. The Messiah is the capstone of the prophets, but they are sort of a first among equals. They still have the same characteristics that are common to the prophets. And I've pulled out some of these for you, and then I'm going to talk about the examples, because these examples matter. Jesus would have been steeped in the tradition of knowing these prophets and their stories, and so he would have intentionally or unintentionally, and certainly those who recorded his life would have been aware of making certain there were parallels with these, within those stories. Prophets, some of this may seem obvious, but it's not, you can't skip it. A prophet is a public figure. You cannot simply be a private person and be a prophet. A prophet has to have some kind of a divine call they speak with an unusual authority. They receive no material compensation for the work they do. So I guess I'm out as a prophet right now. But you all could still be prophets, so let's not forget that. And that's actually the lesson of Pentecost right there. And the lesson is, their message is a challenge. Their message is not simply love and hugs. I mean, it's in there, but they are pushing. They are pushing and challenging, and because of that, in, they are persecuted. This is one of the stories, and this picture is a great example of this from the life of Jesus, as a matter of fact. 
This is from the Gospel of Luke, right near the beginning. I just love this story, and it almost always gets overlooked. I just think it's so human that Jesus has just begun his ministry and returns to his hometown. This is not Nazareth, by the way. This, this is Capernaum. He, Jesus sort of has two hometowns because um, there's no synagogue in Nazareth. And when he's teaching there, they say, who is this guy? And he tells them, and it'll be coming up as an example in a minute, a story about Elijah the prophet, which you have to know the story of Elijah because he, he only references it in a way that you have to understand the story to know what's going on. And it offends them so much that they frog march him out of town to a nearby cliff where they're going to throw Jesus off the cliff. Now, it says that he passed through them and went on his way. I'm always curious how messy his hair was or how torn his robes were by the time he'd gotten through passing through them on his way. So I want to speak and I want to give you, because I did not receive much of an overview about the prophets through most of my life as an Episcopalian, other than to possibly be able to name a couple of them. I want to spend a little time talking about how a number of the prophets hit a number of these characteristics that I was talking about. And this actually right here, this picture is from the life of Elijah. So I'll talk about that in a minute. And he's being fed by ravens because he ticked the king off so much he's had to go into hiding. So that's a, an example of the persecutions that are happening. I have put these not in their order of importance, but unlike the Old Testament, I've put them in chronological order for you. Um, Sam, so first we have Samuel. And Samuel, of course, is very famous for that wonderful passage about when he's a boy and serving in the temple, and Eli is the high priest, and he hears God calling him, and in, then he says, here I am, Lord. Um, and what he's called to do is he's called to be the prophet that will lead Israel from the time of the judges into the time of having kings. So his role inside of that is to be a kingmaker, the first kingmaker. Public figure, can't get more public than that, right? And as a public figure, he makes Saul the king. But when Saul doesn't please God, he then has to go and communicate directly to Saul that Saul hasn't done what God wants. He says directly, why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Those, that's a direct quote from, from, from uh, Samuel to Saul. And because of that, he tells Saul to his face that he's been rejected as the king. And he then has to, what, it's an interesting thing that happens in the life of Samuel is somehow he's still involved around court. But when he goes off, this is worth noting, when he goes off to anoint David to be the next king, there's subterfuge involved in that story. It's very dangerous what Samuel is about. He goes off into the countryside. He's just, he's just going for a visit. He's not going to anoint anybody as a king. And by the way, oh, don't you have a lot of lovely sons? Couldn't they all come by here and I could have a look at them? So Samuel is the first of these public figures. And one of his disciples is Nathan. Nathan is a prophet during the time that David is king. And Nathan is most famous for the infamous events around the story of Uriah and Bathsheba, which you may remember are when David chose not to go off to war and was hanging out on the roof of his palace and happened to look down and saw Bathsheba in a state of undress and uh, helped himself. I think would be a not very polite euphemism, but not as bad as some. And then had Uriah killed when it turned out Bathsheba was pregnant with his child. He did a whole thing where he tried to have Uriah come back, 
and then cover up the pregnancy, and that didn't work, and so he sent a note along with uh, Uriah to have him be in the front of the battle, and he died. And so apparently this was a not very well-kept secret that everybody was aware of, but nobody was talking to King David about, until Nathaniel comes in and tells a story. He tells a story to David about a, a, an owner of a giant flock of sheep who goes and takes the one ewe that belongs to a poor man. And David becomes incensed. He says, well, that guy's going to get his just desserts. And then Samuel says to his face, well, good, because that's you. And he, he makes the same comment that um, Samuel had made to Saul, Nathan makes to David, that the Lord will be rejecting him as the king. David is able to plead for remaining king, but there's still a cost. That child is lost. The next one on this list is the most famous and most influential of the prophets, Elijah. Now, Elijah, you may or may not recall that Elijah often early in the Gospels when people meet Jesus, they ask if he is of the return of Elijah. And so Elijah is, and of course the other thing, Elijah is understood to be a prophet who will return at the time of the Messiah. And he has this dramatic event which happens, not the event that's shown here, but the most dramatic event that happens in the life of Elijah is that Elijah has to confront the king as well because they are worshiping false gods. And this is the incredible story of how they kind of have a, a prayer off between all the priests of Baal and Elijah, where they're trying to call down fire to light up the sacrificial. Um, they've set up an altar, and all these priests of Baal can't do it. And then Elijah like pulls a, a big power move and says, dump all this water on it. More water. I want the water to just run off of this in rivulets. And then he calls down fire and it lights all of this up. And then there's consequences for these priests of Baal that we won't get into too closely right now. But still, there's this issue of false worship. And so Elijah is sent to the king, who's King Ahab, and he is told to tell him that there will be a famine that will run through the country for three years. And the king is, you know, if you can't, if you can't get to the person who made the message, take care of the messenger, right? Threatens him with death, and he has to go into hiding. And that's what he's doing. He's, he lives in this wadi cherith, and the ravens feed him for three years. And then when he's told he can return, he still doesn't want to because, you know, that's the other thing. The work of the prophets is challenging, even to many of the prophets. They understand how risky it is. For, his, for the wife of the king, Jezebel, is still insistent that he would have to die. And it's so bad, and you'll hear this reflected in the next story from Jonah, he asks, he's like, can I just be dead rather than share this message, please? Would you just strike me dead instead? And of course, God's response to that is, I'm not done with you yet. Go do what I, go tell folks the hard news that you have to share. So he goes, goes and does that um, to Elijah as well. Jonah, of course, is everybody's favorite children's story and a irregular prophet in many, many ways, but he still fits some of the important sort of structural pieces. You may not remember that why he ends up in the belly of a whale is because God has told him he has to deliver a challenging message to the most powerful nation in the world, which is Assyria, whose capital is Nineveh, and Jonah's like, no way. I am out of here. Uh, you know, you can't make me send this message if you can't find me. So he thinks he's going to get on this ship and be gone. 
but it doesn't work that way. God's, God with God's prophets spits him back out, and Jonah is a very hmm, um, unenthusiastic messenger. But he takes this message to Nineveh, and what happens is they, and, and the message is very similar. The city will be destroyed unless you change your ways. And unlike so many of these stories, in this story, they do change their ways. Now, of course, Jonah also finds this to be so challenging that he as well asks to die. And instead, God sort of plays with him at the end of that story. And then just very quickly, because they fit the same pattern, and I think you see how it works. Of course, there are more prophets than this, but I'm just highlighting a couple of them. Hosea is a prophet of the northern kingdom. I should have a map for you here. One of the things that can be challenging for us in this time is that we know the story of King David who ruled all of Israel, but for most of the time before the Babylonian captivity, um, Israel splits into two kingdoms, a northern kingdom, which is known as Israel, and a southern kingdom, which is known as Judea. Hosea is a prophet to the northern kingdom at the time the northern kingdom is destroyed first. He's a prophet to the northern kingdom at the time of the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. And Hosea is telling them if they do not change their ways, it's going to be the end of them. And he makes the dramatic public choice as a way of confronting others with what lays before them by <laughs> marrying a prostitute, which he uses as a visual sign of how the people of Israel are in their relationship to God right now, not very faithfully. Yeah, I, I, I wonder what the family portrait looked like. Um, <laughs> So with that as background, we get to the prophets who are at the time of Jesus. And John the Baptist certainly fits the same mode again. He's very much a public figure. He's out there in the wilderness. He shows up in Josephus, independent third-party source. He's certainly been called by God. He communicates with a kind of authority that catches people at attention, right? You know, and that there's risk and danger for them unless they change their ways. Even now the ax lays at the root, he says, right? And I on my threshing floor will separate the wheat from the chaff. And John, who of course goes around with camel's hair and uh, a rope and, and a rope for a belt certainly was not being paid, and he too is persecuted. It's again, as a re, we did talk about this uh, at an earlier session, but the death of John the Baptist is almost certainly because of his role as a public figure in a system, a dominant, a system of domination, where he's calling out the leaders for not following their religious practices. Uh, Herod has married his sister's wife. It's a big no-no in the Old Testament, particularly the way he did it while his brother was still alive. And he's called him out publicly for this, and it, has, it ends up costing him his life. So that's a little bit... Oh, are we awake here? There we go. And that's a little bit about the prophets, and I think, although it may seem obvious because we always talk about it, it's worthwhile to see the parallels between them and between what the characteristics are that Jesus chooses to embody. He is certainly a public figure. He's gathered these disciples around him, these students, and then he's teaching publicly and traveling publicly and gathering large crowds. Some of the feeding stories say four or 5,000 people on some occasions. He is certainly called by God. All four of the Gospels, one of the stories they have in them is the baptism story, which is incredibly dramatic. 
a dramatic affirmation of a call by God. The visitation of the Holy Spirit, the rending open of the heavens, the naming, the voice of God speaking, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus speaks with an unusual level of authority, which if you were to go in and look at the stories of Jesus more carefully, often shows up, there will be an exchange where he is either speaking to a Pharisee or a rich man or a, someone in the crowd, and there's a disagreement or there's a hard question in there. And in the ancient world, one of the traits, the characteristics that was most appreciated was having a quick wit and a capacity rhetoric to be able to make your point in a way that others were left dumbfounded. They had no response to what you said. And you'll find that happens regularly if you go back and look through the gospel texts. That Jesus will give a response and whoever was trying to challenge him on it, it'll say that they were amazed and astounded, dumbfounded. They don't have anything more to say in response to that. And of course, Jesus was not paid. The most famous example of this is when he commissions the 70 in the book of Luke, he sends them out with no purse, no bag, no sandals. Jesus kept a common purse. We know that because that comes up in the story when Judas is going to betray him. He apparently owned nothing of his own. And as we're all well aware, Jesus was persecuted, tried, convicted, tortured, and then crucified. And as I've mentioned already, Jesus is regularly named, or there are questions about his role as a prophet that show up in the text. Jesus himself names himself as a prophet on more than one occasion. That story with the picture of him getting ready to them try to throw him off the cliff, when he can't do any deeds of power in Capernaum, Jesus says, a prophet is without honor, except in his hometown. He names himself as a prophet. And again, in all three of the canonical Gospels, others ask if he is the coming again of Elijah. He is named as a prophet at uh, the entering of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Those who are gathered there name him as a prophet. And even after his death, when you think about the road to Emmaus story, and the two that are walking along the road and do not recognize Jesus, and Jesus asks, asks them to tell him about this person, the language they use is a prophet, mighty in deed and word. So, if Jesus is the last of the prophets, what's next? Well, here's what the expectation of what's next is in the domination system. Nothing. The end. End of the story. This is from the movie Spartacus, right here, for those of you who are old enough. But it is a scene which is um, well recorded in the ancient world that after the battle where Spartacus was defeated, 5,000 former slaves were crucified. End of story. Domination system would say nothing is next except the old way, going back to the system that already existed. But when it's almost time for the domination system to play its final card, which during Holy Week we see Jesus' response to this, when it becomes clear by the middle of Holy Week that what's next is arrest, trial, and death, this is the time that Jesus starts to talk about what will come after his death. And that's the paraclete. The word that you'll see used today is advocate. That comes from the Latin word. The word that, of course, the Gospel of John is written in is Greek. And the word that's used is paraclete. It's used four times in what's known as the last, the final discourse. So this is Jesus' final 
goodbye to his friends at the Last Supper. And they want to know when and how they will see Jesus again. And he says, well, I'm going to the Father, but I'm going to send you this paraclete. And the paraclete, it's a curious choice. I don't know enough of the background of why the language choice was made. That in many of the texts, this word is translated as comfortor. And I think that has to do with what the role of a paraclete would be. But it loses the sense of what a paraclete is. For a paraclete in that time was your legal counselor, effectively your attorney or your advocate who assisted you if you were going into a civil trial. The Roman system was very complicated and extremely strict. If you said the wrong thing in the wrong place, your, ca your case could be thrown out of court. And so for Jews who weren't familiar with this system, they would hire a person, like you would hire an attorney now, to serve as their helper, their counselor, their advocate, their attorney. So I guess that's a comfort, right? You need someone to comfort you to get through this complicated, dangerous process. But the person really serves the role of what we would think of as a good legal counselor. This is a picture, by the way, of Cicero. This is the reason I want you to see Cicero, and again, this is not, we don't have enough time for this to be a 101 Roman uh, culture class as well. But Cicero is really interesting and important figure, very close to the time of the life of Jesus, very late Roman Republic, into the beginning of the empire. He is not a person who comes from wealth. He is not a person who comes from a landed family. He is an but he becomes one because of his power of rhetoric, his power as an attorney, his power and capacity to advocate and make a point for his clients. He's incredibly famous and influential in that way. And so he, like any good paraclete, is someone who speaks publicly for a cause or a client or a policy. So this is what Jesus is sending, is someone who is a public speaker. As a matter of fact, in the Gospel of Luke, when he talks about the Holy Spirit, this is also interesting that really the Holy Spirit is not mentioned hardly at all in the Gospel of Mark. Really only in the Gospel of Matthew with the Great Commission. So most of the text we have comes from Luke and John, and then the book of Acts, which is an extension of Luke. And in Luke, when he's getting ready, to, when Jesus is preparing for his death, this is the way he describes the Holy Spirit. Do not worry how to defend yourself. For the Holy Spirit will teach you and tell you what to say. See, so already defense, like in a trial, and that it's about speaking and knowing what to say publicly. I believe that this is really the heart of what our message is for Pentecost and what it means to be engaged in the work of Jesus still in the world. And that means an extension of the politics of Jesus. And that is that the Holy Spirit is not simply someone who sent, it's not a she, they, the Holy Spirit, this member of the Trinity, who is simply sent for your own personal comfort. But they are sent, as you can see today, as we'll read in the reading from Acts, as a place of empowerment, not for self-protection, but to speak out and to others on their behalf. After all, that's the story we're going to hear here in 40 minutes from the book of Acts. When these flames alight on their heads, it isn't that they're personally healed or directly go up to heaven or that it says they know God in a way they never knew God before. 
the Holy Spirit, what it does to them is drive them out of a place of hiding and into the world where they then must speak to be a public witness. And that's what it says. That's what's happening in the story of Pentecost. And that empowerment is actually at the beginning of the book of Acts in chapter 1. There's a recap of Jesus' ascension. And when he talks about the Holy Spirit, he says, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit to be my witness, to be the person who goes out and speaks on my behalf. And so the, the Holy Spirit is Jesus' way of carrying the message into a community that becomes the prophet rather than single individuals. The expectation and responsibility of those characteristics I shared with you earlier about the prophets now move beyond being the responsibility of one or two or three individuals at a time, but becomes the responsibility of all of those who are part of the body of believers, where they are to provide the context from their own age, just as Jesus did in his where they are to name and resist the systems of a domination that exist in their own world, Jesus, just like Jesus did in his, and is a place where we can speak up on behalf of group decision-making and power relationships, politics, in a way that put people first. For here is the language, oh, sorry. For here is the language that you'll hear today that relates to the Pentecost story, and I'm not sure you're going to hear it in English, so it'd be worth your hearing now. For I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. See, the prophets. And your young men will see vision, and your old men will dream dreams. I will pour out my spirit in these days. See, this is that if you if you actually knew the if we want again, it's another level of study. But if you look at the way the verb tense is used, this is an open-ended these, this time, all times now. And they will prophesy. And so the Holy Spirit, the work of Jesus and the politics of Jesus. In the words of the catechism, is God at work in the world, in the church, even now? So here's some examples from the last hundred years, including some folks who made it out to Pride just yesterday. Well, that's what I have for you today about the coming I Will Send You the Advocate as the last piece of what is the intention of Jesus as a public figure. His intention, after he's provided context and then spoken into, proclaimed, and resisted a system of domination, is to build not only one off of prophets to come, but a community that can fill that role instead and speak up on behalf of others. Are there any questions? We've still got five minutes. Comments? Yes, Mike. What I find interesting is that even today, even some of our modern churches and church structures uh, still try to revert back to that domination mode, where you have a hierarchy which tells you what to whether it be uh, through bishops, cardinals, popes, or through an authoritarian structure in terms of a uh, Baptist convention. Right. Thank you, Mike. So again, if anybody online, just comment that the church seems to want to slide into the same authoritarian systems that Jesus seems to have come into the world to 
uh, resist. And certainly the example of the current Southern Baptist Convention and some pieces on that and historic examples from many other denominations show that. Absolutely. I mean, I, Mike, um, first a couple of quick comments on that. First of all, you'll notice that Jesus never sets up an institution of the church. The coming of the church is not, Jesus doesn't say, I will send you the Holy Spirit and he, and he shall use or they shall use Robert's rules of order and you shall have a rotating set of executive council or whatever that might look like. Um, there isn't, it's certainly the, the world and the church get messy pretty quickly, even in the institution of how the church organizes itself. Um, that is absolutely true. Any other questions, comments? All right, I'm going to say thank you all very much for coming and, and participating in this series. It's a pleasure to put it together for you. And there's a lot to get ready for church here in about a half an hour. So we'll say goodbye for now. Um, thank you all. Mm -hmm.